Daniel chapter 1. Now in the thirtieth year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Kabar, the heavens opened and I saw visions of God. In the fifth of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiachin's, Jehoiachin's captivity, Yahweh's words came to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kabar, and Yahweh's hand was there on him. I looked, and behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, a great cloud with flashing lightning and brightness around it, and out of the middle of it, as it were, glowing metal, out of the middle of the fire. Out of its centre came the likeness of four living creatures. This was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Everyone had four faces, and each one of them had four wings. Their wings, their feet were straight feet. The sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like burnished bronze. They had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides. The four of them had their faces and their wings like this. Their wings were joined to one another. They didn't turn wherever they went. Each one of them went straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, they had the face of a man. The four of them had the face of the lion on the right side. The four of them had the face of an ox on the left side. The four of them also had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. Their wings were spread out above. Two wings of each one touched another, and two covered their bodies. Each one went straight forward. Where the spirit was to go, they went. They didn't turn when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches. The fire went up and down among the living creatures. The fire was bright, and lightning went out of the fire. The living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. Now as I saw the living creatures, behold, there was one wheel on the earth beside the living creatures for each of the four faces of it. The appearance of the wheels and their work was like a barrel. The four of them had one likeness. Their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel within a wheel. Where, when they went, they went in their four directions. They didn't turn when they went. As for their rims, they were high and dreadful, and the four of them had their rims full of eyes all around. When the living creatures went, the wheels went beside them. When the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Wherever the spirit was to go, they went. The spirit was to go there. The wheels were lifted up beside them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. When those went, these went. When those stood, these stood. When those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up beside them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. Over the head of the living creatures, there was the likeness of an expanse, like an awesome crystal to look at, stretched out over their heads above. Under the expanse, their wings were straight, one toward the other. Each one had two, which covered on this side, and each one had two, which covered their bodies on that side. When they went, I heard the noise of their wings, like the noise of great waters, like the voice of the Almighty, the noise of the tumult, like the noise of an army. When they stood, they let down their wings. There was a voice above the expanse that was over their heads. When they stood, they let down their wings. Above the expanse that was over their head was the likeness of a throne, as the appearance of a sapphire stone. On the likeness of the throne was a likeness as the appearance of a man on it above. I saw, as it were, glowing metal, as the appearance of fire within it all around, from the appearance of his waist and upward, and from the appearance of his waist and downward, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire, and there was brightness around him. As the appearance of the rainbow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness all around. This was the appearance of the likeness of Yahweh's glory. When I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard a voice of one that spoke. Well, welcome to the book of Ezekiel. <laughs> and um, you can see that it's, there's something different going on. I've got my friend here. <laughs> and um, the book of Ezekiel is uh, one of the four major prophets. And 
we, we call them the four major prophets because they wrote the most amount of material. It doesn't mean those four prophets were more important than any of the other prophets. But the books of Ezekiel, um, Jeremiah and Isaiah and Daniel are the four major prophets. Their books tend to be bigger. So this is the fourth, uh, well, it's the third actually because we haven't got to Daniel. So Ezekiel is one of the major prophets and he has a lot of material to cover, 48 chapters. This is chapter one. Now, I'll explain the skull in a minute. But um, Isaiah prophesied 100 years before Ezekiel. He prophesied when King Hezekiah was in Jerusalem, and we've talked about him plenty. We've just finished the book of Jeremiah and Lamentations, not, uh, you know, just recently. Jeremiah and Ezekiel are alive at the same time. In fact, Jeremiah is in Jerusalem at the moment that Ezekiel is prophesying this in Babylon. So they're actually in two different places receiving words from the Lord at roughly the same time. So what happened was Nebuchadnezzar came and attacked Jerusalem initially and um, he took away people from Jerusalem like Daniel and he went off to Babylon. So the book of Daniel, which we'll get to, Daniel's over there. But then Nebuchadnezzar came back a second time and he took some more people away and Ezekiel was one of those. Now Ezekiel goes off to Babylon too, but not to the city of Babylon he goes to the Kabar River, which was mentioned here. It says he was, you know, by the Kabar River on this certain day. That river is actually in between Babylon and where Baghdad is today. So it's about 200 kilometers south of where modern day Baghdad is, I've got written here. And Babylon was further south of that. So we've got three of the four major prophets all alive at the same time, all prophesying at the same time from three different locations. So the Lord is is really, there's a lot of prophetic stuff happening and the Lord's doing it all at once. So we're in Babylon, we're with Ezekiel, but we're not in the city of Babylon. We're in the, you know, the Babylonian territory, but we're by the Kabar River. And now it, Ezekiel very handy, handily dates this prophecy. And in fact, as we go through the book of Ezekiel, we're going to find out that he dates everything. He always says, you know, at a certain day, in a certain month. That's very, very cool because Jeremiah never dated anything. And Jeremiah's book is not in chronological order. So it's a, it's, we've got to figure out, you know, when things were said and what they're applying to in some cases. But Ezekiel, it's the historian's dream. <laughs> Everything's nicely dated. So it says here, in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Kaba. So he dates it. And he places it. This is where I was. This is the time when I was there. And I saw this vision. So very organized. And um, so that's that's what we find all the way through Ezekiel, all this nice dating and placing of things, except this very first one. He says, in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the river, captives by the river Kabar, the heavens were opened. So you think, well, in the 30th year of what? We don't know. <laughs> so he's nicely dated it for us, but we don't know what the date means. Now, as we as we go down a little bit later, it says that, that it was in the fifth of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiakim. So he now dates it. We now get a proper dating, but we still didn't know. Or no one seems to know what this 30th year is referring to. But our, our dear friend Matthew Henry and a few other wonderful people have suggested that at the very start of the book, He's telling us how old he is. So he's telling us, this, and it seems to be what is the best suggestion we've got. It seems to be that at the very first chapter, at the start of his prophetic ministry, with all the chapters that are to follow, all in chronological order, this young man, Ezekiel, it seems like he's 30 years of age. So if that's the truth, then he's the same age as Jesus when he entered into the ministry. So we've got a young man here, a 30-year-old, and he's received his first vision and he's in Babylon. Now, because of the fact that it was dated um, in the fifth year of Jehoiachin, we know something. We know that Jerusalem hasn't been destroyed yet, and Jerusalem's going to be destroyed in about five or six years from the time of this prophecy. Now, this prophecy, we'll talk about more about it in a minute, but all the things that are to follow are going to 
the initial prophecies are going to be about that destruction of Jerusalem that hasn't happened yet. But then after it happens, there's going to be other prophecies as we go through the book. And it's very, very handy to know the history of Jerusalem because we've just been talking about it for like months. It's very, very handy to know all that and to slot the prophecies in. So what often happens is that people who are new in the faith or they haven't studied the Bible, they read these prophetic books and they have no clue what it's all talking about because they don't know how to slot the prophecies into the historical events. Well, I'll help you with that. Now, Ezekiel, he's, his style of prophecy or his style is what we would call apocalyptic. Now, when, when, when we say something's apocalyptic, we all think, oh, it's about the end of the world. And, but it's no, it's not about the end of the world. Apocalyptic means it's a genre. You know, like um, there's, there's, there's genres like poetic and there's narrative, which is prose. There's historical. There's different genres. And even there's, there's comedy, for example, but then there's even like sub-genres. So you might have dark comedy or you might have, you know, um, sarcasm or, you know, there's all, there's all different like styles. Well, apocalyptic is a style of prophecy. It's, a, it's almost like a genre. And it's this kind of very highly symbolic style. If you think of the book of Revelation with all of its symbols, dragons and beasts and crowns and thrones and bottomless pits, that's apocalyptic. And that's why when we say apocalyptic, we think end of the world because the, the book that in theory was about the end of the world, which when we get to it, you'll find out it's a lot less about the end of the world than what you think. But a lot of people think it is about the end of the world. And because it's the apocalyptic style, that style has come to mean in people's minds, oh, that's the end of the world. But no, it's not. Ezekiel is a book in the apocalyptic style. And it's and already in the first chapter we're seeing four beasts and with angels with wings and wheels within wheels and it's all really symbolic. Well, that's the apocalyptic style kicked right in in chapter one already. So, I've got my friend here. <laughs> I've called decided to call him Yorick <laughs> because uh, this this is a plaster of Paris skull. It's not real. I bought it on Etsy. The guy that makes these, he produces them for Shakespeare plays. And um, someone who bought it, you know, said, um, Yorick has done a great job. Obviously, Yorick is the character in the Shakespeare play. So we've got Yorick here, and he's going to join us for the Ezekiel videos. <laughs> and uh, later on in the book of Ezekiel, um, we get to the Valley of the Dry Bones. And that's also apocalyptic. You know, there's all this apocalyptic symbolism in the book of Ezekiel. And the Valley of the Dry Bones is, is, is the one chapter I think a lot of people, a lot of Christians remember that chapter of Ezekiel. And there's, so there's nothing, when you think of Ezekiel, you know, what jumps out is, you know, is the bones. So I thought, well, we need a, a symbol here to represent this book of Ezekiel. And there's a lot to say about the bones. And um, when we get to that later. But in the meanwhile, this friend will accompany us through the book. <laughs> and... Uh, I remember years ago um, looking at a painting of St. Jerome, the early church, one of the early church fathers, and he translated the Bible into Latin, the Vulgate, for the, um, you know, and the Catholic Church used the Latin Bible for like over a thousand years. And St. Jerome, in, in this painting, he had a skull on his desk, just like this. But it was a real human skull, and um, he... Apparently, that painting was authentic. Like the the painting was showing what really was the case. You know, he really did have a human skull on his desk when he was translating the Vulgate. And apparently, his reasoning was that life is so temporary. You know, the Lord He's eternal, but we're temporary. And this skull that was on his desk always reminded him to be humble and fear the Lord. So as we go through the book of Ezekiel and consider all the things that it means and or at least we try to figure them out and understand them, let's be mindful that we have an eternal God and let this let our friend help us remember that we are temporary. So in this first chapter, it's very similar to the first chapter of the book of Revelation. In the first chapter of Revelation, John has a, an appearance of this character with burning bronze like a and his voice was like living waters and he fell down like a dead man 
Well, here, Ezekiel has this vision of four creatures, but, but it's like they were also glowing. And when they spoke, it, was like, it sounded like rushing waters, and he falls down in terror. So it sounds very, very similar to the book of, of Revelation. And I think Ezekiel is having a vision of God's glory. And so the result is he falls down. He has an experience of the fear of the Lord. So we're about to embark through this. I have to say to you, I have no idea what these four living creatures mean. But we find in the book of Revelation, there are four living creatures and they're circling around the throne of God. So you're going to find as we go through Ezekiel, there are a lot of similarities between this book and the book of Revelation. And we're having glimpses into God's presence here that we don't understand. You know, Paul went to be with the Lord and he said he, he described it by saying that it was indescribable. Well, Ezekiel here is trying to describe things he's seen, but that doesn't make a great deal of sense. He's describing wheels within wheels that rise and go and no one turns, but we don't understand these things. But somehow in it, we realize that there's, we have a, an awesome God who's very glorious. And it's so much the case that Ezekiel falls down on his face terrified. I don't know if you've ever been terrified. Um, I remember once climbing a mountain with some of my boys and they weren't treating it with seriousness. And I thought one of those kids was going to fall off the cliff and I was so worried for him. I held that kid's hand and would not let it go. You could say I was terrified. <laughs> terrified for him, not for me. So I don't know that I've really experienced a genuine feeling of being terrified. Ezekiel does here. John does in Revelation chapter 1. It's the fear of the Lord. So the glory of God is magnificent. Well, we're about to journey. If you could summarize the book of Ezekiel in one word or one idea, it would be it's all about the glory of the Lord. And we're going to journey into it in the chapters ahead. Lord, I thank you for this book, Ezekiel. And I do pray that as we journey into Ezekiel, you'd unlock our understanding, help us to understand the word of God, but also pray you'd give us an experience of the glory of God. Amen.